We're at the end of the year. There's a couple of ways that I could go through this week and next week. One is looking back and the other is looking forward. And I always think it's good to look back. But we happen to have a scripture in our reading this week, the one that we just read, that gives us a doctrinal point that he wanted to make sure the Jews understood. And in fact, he accuses them of not having a good mind or a good faith uh, because they rejected, didn't, didn't like what he was uh, saying. But basically, it gives us also an idea of the mind of God. And the mind of God is much, much greater than what we actually can describe. But notice this man who owns this uh, vineyard, and he uh, goes out and hires people to come work. Now, I've worked uh, day labor before. It's been a while since I've done much of it. But I remember being hired, going out and working all day, and getting paid at the end of the day. That was basically the law of Moses requirement, though, wasn't it? that a man who did his labor, was, it was necessary to pay him. Not next week, not next month, but now. If he worked that day, you paid him that day. At the end of the day, you actually received your pay. Now, he agrees with him in the beginning of the morning. We know the story. You just read it. He says, uh, will you work for this much all day long? Yes. Okay. Go to it then. A little while later, he comes out and finds some others still there, and he hires them and sends them out to the fields. He says, whatever is right, I will pay you. I think that's kind of interesting, because he doesn't agree with them to pay them the same amount. He just says, whatever's right. Then a little bit later, he finds some others, and they're still there, and he sends them out to work. And then a little bit later, he does the same thing. But of course, the interesting part is the last part of the day. How many of you in here work 12-hour days? Six days a week. Usually you're working for yourself when you're doing that now, aren't you? Because if, if you're working Intel and you're working one of those three 12-hour day programs, you're, you're working three days a week, right? Or something similar. I don't know what their schedule is now. But when you're working 12 hours a day, six days a week, seven days a week, you're working for yourself generally today. But at that time, that wasn't the case. That was daylight hours. That goes back somewhat to the farming community, the agriculture time we come out of. Any of you in here grew up on a farm? A couple of you did, yeah. Uh, I notice you're not living on a farm now. That's hard work, isn't it? And I remember uh, hearing a guy talking about having hired a foreman for his farm, and he was disappointed because he took off the day at, at dinner time. I said, well, isn't that what you're supposed to do? He says, no, a farm, you work until the work's done or until you can't work anymore. You still take dinner time, don't get me wrong, but you work. And you do. Well, anyway, these laborers go out. They agree to do it. And then it comes time to pay. And instead of paying the ones who started the first hour of the day first, he has his, his uh, taskmaster, supervisor, pay the last ones first, and then the first ones last. You think he was setting something up there? Obviously he was. He wanted that conflict, didn't he? He was trying to make a point, of course. Now, this is just a story. I don't know that that would have ever actually been done by the uh, master of a vineyard or a farm. But that's what he did, just to make a point. He paid them exactly the same as he had agreed to pay the ones who started at the beginning of the day. You say, well, that doesn't seem fair. Well, they didn't think so either, did they? Now, why do you think he gave this story? It's really a fairly obvious connection, isn't it? If we look at the Jews, going back to Abraham, we don't know exactly when Abraham lived, do we? I mean, if you go back and look at the uh, timelines, you may find a date uh, put on there of 1800 B.C., 2000 B.C., 2200 B.C. We don't really know exactly when it was. We have a fair idea of when it happened later. They were in captivity for how long? According to the scriptures, they were in captivity for 400 years. Then Moses came along, and God put Moses up to get, let, get him uh, let go. And it says later that there was approximately 400 years of the judges before they had their first king. So it goes back a ways, doesn't it? But we do know that approximately 1400 to 1500 B.C., when Moses leads them out of Egypt, they stop at the base of a mountain called Sinai. 
And Moses is called up onto the mountain, and God gives him a law. God makes a covenant with the children of Israel. He says, you be my people, and I will be your God. Now that was 1400 B.C. So you as a culture now, you're a Jew living in the time of Christ, you as a culture have been told, your parents were told, your grandparents were told, generation after generation after generation for over a thousand years have been told you're the people of God. God is going to reward you because you're his people. And everybody who wasn't one of you was rejected by God, was outside, was lost. They were not part of God's people. And now Jesus comes along and says, uh, okay, now the Gentiles are okay. Well, he doesn't really quite say it that way, does he? He actually tells them the prophecies that said to Abraham, through your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. All nations would be blessed. He goes back and quotes out of the prophecies concerning Abraham. He goes down through the years and shows some of the other prophecies that told that it was going to be to the people, uh, the house of God, the house of prayer. For whom? To the Jews? Was the temple a house of prayer just for the Jews? It was mandated by law that the Jews were the only ones who had access to the temple itself. But actually it is stated that it was a house of prayer for all nations as well. So this is not something that's really new, but it's something that seems a little difficult to understand. Jesus in the prophecies concerning the coming of the Christ, not just that a virgin would conceive and bear a son, but that his name would be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He would be the one who would take the sins upon himself, the sins of the whole world upon himself. Not just the sins of the Jews, but all sins of all mankind. And then he would say, but I'm going to give the same reward to the latecomers as I gave to the beginners. You ever hear about having stars in your crown? I mean, they, that's something we used to talk about when I was younger. I don't know. I haven't heard too much of it in recent years. We even have songs that we used to sing about it. Uh, we earn stars in our crown. We earn rewards in heaven. Uh, by the way, are there levels of reward in heaven? We know from the inspired writings of Dante that there are levels of hell. And I'm being facetious, so some of you caught that. We don't have any idea about that at all. But let me tell you something. If there are rewards in heaven, in other words, greater glory given to some as opposed to others, it's kind of hard to fit that into this particular passage, isn't it? There may be other passages that intimate something like that, and I really am not going to argue the point because I don't think we have enough information to argue it one way or the other. But in this one, it seems to indicate that we all get the same thing. Now, that is not American for sure, is it? That sounds like socialism and communism. On the other hand, it doesn't really quite fit into the economics of the world anyway, does it? We can argue economics in a worldly sense all we want, but in a spiritual sense, it doesn't fit that way, does it? How many of you in here deserve to go to heaven? I'm the only one? We don't deserve to go to heaven, do we? If we receive heaven, we receive it because it is a what of God? By grace, a gift of God. Romans chapter 6 in particular, he says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is what? Eternal life in Christ Jesus. If we understand that, then we understand that it doesn't make any difference whether we worked for thousands of years as a people, or whether we worked for literally five minutes before we died, and at that last hour, we became a believer and received the grace of God. It doesn't matter, because we don't deserve it anyway, do we? Now, he doesn't make that argument in this passage, does he? 
He doesn't make the argument that the ones who work from first of the day to the end didn't deserve more. He just said the ones who didn't work as much deserved more, deserved the same, actually. Now, you know, if I came in at 5 o'clock and I got off at 6 and I worked that one hour, I'd expect one hour of, of uh, pay. How much did you get hired for? So much an hour. Well, we're, our economy is so different now than what it was then. Instead of a denarius a day, it's so many dollars an hour. So we'd think of it that way. We've got rules. The employers have to follow rules, don't they? Well, God doesn't have to follow rules. Well, okay, he follows his own rules. Let's put it that way. But his rules are based upon grace, mercy, pardon me, love, very good. His rules are based upon something that's different than the economy of the world. So here's a Jewish people who has been told for 1,400, 1,500 years that they are the people of God. Perhaps going back to the descendants of Abraham to 2000 BC, let's just use that as a round figure. For two millennium, you're the people of God. And you're going to be given this great reward because you have been faithful people of God. By the way, were the children of Israel faithful? Sometimes. Sometimes not. Yeah. But he says, as long as you're obedient to my word, you'll be my people and I'll be your God. Nevertheless, through that seed, all the nations would be blessed. Now, that's the technical point. That meant that the rest of the world, what they called the Gentiles, or in other passages they referred to as the Greeks, would receive the reward of God as well in Christ Jesus. Not automatically. This doesn't say that everybody is automatic. They still had to be hired. Any of you in here don't like your job? Anybody in here who don't like your job but are unwilling to admit it in public? <laughs> How about, uh, let, let's put it another way. Any of you in here ever complain about your job? As that's just about 100%, isn't it? Yeah. At one time or another, and by the way, preachers are not exempt from this. I've heard old preachers say time and time again, preaching wouldn't have been so bad if it hadn't been for the people. And you can insert whatever you want to put in there, if it wasn't for the elders, or if it wasn't for the deacons, or whatever. It's every job. There are things to complain about. How many of you complain about being a Christian? It's a job. We were hired for it. You say, well, yeah, but we chose that job. Yeah, but the Bible doesn't describe it that way. The Bible describes it as God having chose us, right? Uh, having chose, uh, pardon me, English teachers, uh, Chosen, uh, there we go, better. <laughs> Got to get that right. All right, so God chose us for a work, uh, a job, if you will, an employment, and occasionally we get tired. We get frustrated. We get a little down in the dumps about it, maybe even complaining. That's not fair, is it? We don't deserve this job in the first place, do we? Okay, that's the grand theology of it. The more specific theology is me. What's my obligation to my employer? To do the job he hired me to do, right? Are you doing that job? We're coming to the end of a year, let's assess it. Look back on that year, have you been doing that job this year? And I don't look just at the failures. By the way, is every human being you know perfect enough in their work that they're always giving 100% at every single second moment, never wasting a minute on the job, never doing anything they shouldn't do, never failing to be perfect in their work. Any of you in here? I'm the only one? That's not the way humans work, is it? Do you think God understands that? What does he talk about us confessing our sins? Why does he talk about him being willing to forgive us our sins? Why does it say that he is willing to receive us back? Why does he give us the story of the prodigal son? Why does he give us this story of grace, mercy, and love? Because he knows we're human. Why does he know that? Well, first of all, he made us. But second of all, he sent his son Jesus to live here as a man 
And it says that Jesus is the mediator between God and man now. And I get the impression what that is, is having experienced it himself, God in the flesh is able to explain to God in the spirit so that he understands. Now, has he got patience that'll last for seemingly forever? Yeah. But is his patience ever wear thin? Well, if we ever want to know about how it wears thin, look at the Old Testament. And I think one of the quickest ways to see that is in Judges. A generation grew up that had forgotten the Lord. So he, gra- he raises up a country around about to come take him captive. And then they cry out in their despair to God to deliver them. And he raises up a judge who delivers them from their captives. And for that generation, they worship God and they serve God. And then the next generation grows up that didn't remember God. Um, We've got some kids in here. What is a job as a parent? What's a job as a church? Isn't it to help raise those children up to believe in God? To not forget God? To help have that cycle broken so that that next generation carries on the work, literally hires on to do the same work that we did when we were growing up. So here's this laborer going out to the field. He works, man, I worked in the hard times. How many of you in here have worked Christianity in the hard times? I don't think any of us really have, have we? That doesn't mean we haven't done some hard work as Christians. That's not what I meant. I meant hard times. When a Christian in the first century became a Christian, he might be asked to give what up? His life, his family, his home, his business, his friends. Now, there may be some of you in here who have actually had to give some of that stuff up or were forced because of circumstances, pushed away, if you will, because of your Christianity from family, friends, or others. But generally, we have a pretty easy time of it, don't we? Shouldn't the ones who went through the hardest times expect a greater reward from the Lord than, say, us, who have such a relatively easy time? Those are the kind of questions that philosophers and theologians ask, and then they'll spend an inordinate amount of time explaining why they think their answer to that is right, whichever answer it may be. But I'm kind of like, uh, I like the way Jim Strait puts it. He says, if you look at the history of some of these uh, philosophers, they were not very social people. They spent a lot of time by themselves watching things going on and thinking internally about stuff that most of us don't even care about. I remember the theologians of the uh, Jews Writing the uh, Mishnah and Gemara, I believe it was called, it was actually designed to be a commentary that would set some rules as to how to understand the law of Moses, as if that wasn't enough by itself to explain it. And I remember them explaining, and I think I've mentioned this one before, about the labor on the Sabbath, working on the Sabbath. You shouldn't work on the Sabbath. So, what does that mean? Well, a woman can fix dinner on the Sabbath. That's not considered work. I just thought you women would like to know that. Um, The other thing, too, is a woman can wash dishes on the Sabbath. I like that, too. However, she can't pour the water out into the yard, the dishwater, because there might be a seed out there that gets watered and thus sprouts, and thus she has done labor on the Sabbath and violated God's Sabbath. Now, who thought that up? First thing I hear is, well, obviously a man. Yeah, yeah. But that's kind of the way men's minds works, isn't it? Uh, The other one that comes up every once in a while, somebody says they actually defined how many angels can fit on the head of a pin. Now, how many of you in here have worried about how many angels fit on the head of a pin? Not in a long time? Yeah, since your drug days, is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, not in a long time. We worry about these kinds of things. We miss the point by doing so. The Jews of Jesus' time had the wrong attitude. They thought they should receive more because they, they actually thought they should receive it all. That nobody else should get it. 
That's why it was so difficult in the early church. And that's why God had to show Peter an outright vision as he called him to go to the household of Cornelius, who was not a Jew. He was a godly man, but he was not a Jew, and thus would not have been allowed in the righteous people of God, except God told Peter that God is no respecter of persons. So when the people are hired at the first hour, receive their pay, and they find out it's the same as Cornelius, who received his at the 11th hour, and they start to complain, what does God say? Just like the master of the house. Don't I have the right to do with my own belongings what I want? I have the money to pay what I want. And by the way, is God rich enough to pay us all? My goodness, yes. And we're not just talking about the cattle on a thousand hills. We're talking about the universe itself. We're talking about beyond the universe. I don't know how to explain it. I don't know what to do to explain it. I just know the vastness of his wealth is, and we're not even talking about the material here. It's in his grace and love and mercy. And so the first will be last, the last will be first. Thank you for mentioning that in chapter 19, uh, just prior to this, it ends the same way. The last shall be first. He repeats that several times in the New Testament. The last shall be first, the first shall be last. Well, we could go into more depth on that, but I don't really want to spend time on that this morning because that's more of a humility argument and more of a humility discussion. We need to be the slaves, we need to be the servants. And by the way, in two places he says that. You need to be the slave of all if you want to be the first. You need to be the servant of all if you're going to be the first. We go back to Jesus talking about the table, and if you sit at the foot, then the master of the table comes and tells you that you need to go up to a place of honor instead. It's that kind of humility, that kind of knowing your place, that kind of not presuming too much. Now, you may get the idea that my mother taught me that lesson over and over and over, and she felt I needed it that much, you know. But we'll discuss that some other time. But right now, just remember, the technical argument is the Gentiles were going to be saved too. How about Romans chapter 1, verse 16? Paul says there, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. What do you mean to everyone? You mean everyone who's a Jew? Uh, that means those who are from Judah, those who are from Benjamin, those who are from, uh, I don't know, Dan? No. To everyone, everyone who's a descendant of Adam. Everyone, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Why did they use Greek to refer to everyone else? Because Alexander the Great, some several centuries before, had come through and conquered the known world. And everywhere you went, whether it's in Egypt, whether it's in Babylon, whether it's in uh, Rome or Athens or Jerusalem, you could speak Greek and people there would speak Greek as well. That wasn't their language of their native land, but it was a language of commerce, the language of government, until the Romans took over and then they changed the language of government. But even in government, Greek was accepted. All of them were thought of in terms of being Hellenes, Greeks. How many Gentile Greeks do we have in here this morning? Come on, all of you are Greeks. If you're not a Jew in that sense, you're Gentile. And we have been grafted on, according to Romans. We have become adopted sons. But we have become heirs. Now he says heirs with Christ. But that means we're also heirs with whom? The Jews. All can be saved now. No one is limited. It's not just limited to the Jews only. It's limited only by the faith of the heart of the individual. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. And he doesn't just mention that once. He mentions it over and over again. So I've got this job. Here's the way the job description reads. The job is a 24-hour a day, seven-day-a-week job. 
There'll be many benefits during the time that you're working that job, but you won't have any time to enjoy them because you're going to be working all the time. However, the retirement package is out of this world. You willing to sign up? Oh, addendum to the job description. May occasionally suffer while doing this work. And by the way, one of the job descriptions has in it suffer like the supervisor did. Well, I don't know that I want to go that route. How about you? That's tough, isn't it? Do you think that when they asked someone in the first century whether they wanted to become a Christian or not, they, they uh, had to sit down and analyze it and say, okay, here's the good stuff, you know, the old... Uh, put all the good things in this column and all the bad reasons in that column and, and let's see which actually outweighs the other. And, or do you think they just said, no, this is God and this is Jesus, the Son of God and the rest of it doesn't matter. What benefit will I get if I take this work? No man will serve two masters. He'll despise the one and love the other or hate one, we have a master. Call him a supervisor. Now let's do what the scripture says. Let's call him Lord. You're working 24-7 this last year as a Christian. Does that mean you can't enjoy yourself? No, you can enjoy yourself. Well, do I have to do the same thing next year? Yeah, actually you will going to be harder next year? Well, that's a matter of, pro, of uh, personal preference of how you look at it. I would say this, though. The more experienced you are at doing something, isn't it easier to do it? What do we usually have happen when we get a little bit more experienced, though? We know better, so we get a little bit more frustrated, don't we? Why aren't they listening? And as a preacher, I'm pointing to you. Why aren't you guys listening? The elders are pointing and pointing at each other and others and saying, why aren't they listening? Well, that's human nature, isn't it? God says the same thing, though. Come and follow me. That's what his call was. That's what the job description was. Come follow him. He says, if you're going to be my disciple, I want to be able to find out that everywhere I go, I turn around and there you are with me. Now, that's a paraphrase. But he also talks about the example he left us in suffering for us that we should follow in his steps. We have a Lord and a Savior who has done all this for one reason and one reason alone. And it really boils down to we could not do it ourselves. So he did it for us. Are you willing to work for the Lord on that basis? be employed by the master of the universe who expects a lot but gives a lot in return. One last thing. We've got some old Christians in here. I'm not going to pick you out. But if you ask any of the older Christians in here have been Christians most of their life if not all of their lives if it was worth it or not to an individual every one of them would say what? That's because they're in public. They don't want to tell you the truth, right? No, it's because they believe that. They know it to be true. So Jesus says, the last will be first and the first will be last. And then he says one more thing. Many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called, but few are chosen. For you've been chosen for a work that is the greatest thing in the world that's ever happened. Don't take it lightly thinking that you were chosen because God just is going to choose everybody. Take it because God chose you. And then you live accordingly. Think of this year in those terms. And then think of next year in those terms. As our custom is, we offer an invitation. We're going to do that now. 
If you don't feel you have lived the way you think Christ really wants you to live, then there's a good way to set that straight, and that's to repent and to start over again. We're going to be doing New Year's resolutions this next week, and one of the things that the experts tell us is don't make a resolution because you're going to break it. However, if you make this resolution, maybe it's a good one. God, I'm going to do better this year. God, help me to be better this year. God, help me to be the servant you want me to be this next year. But if you need to do that, then we're inviting you right now to come when we stand and when we sing. <laughs>